So this time we're going to look at the duality which can occur between configurations in 3D space. Ordinary ideas in projective 3D geometry can be converted into some really kind of much less intuitive but completely logically equivalent ideas. So it's much easier if I just show you what I mean. So I'm going to discuss what are called the propositions of incidence. So there's six of these. The first one is that the join of two different points is a line. And then there's a kind of dual proposition, which is that the meet of two different planes is a line. Another proposition is that the join of a line and a point that's not in that line is going to be a plane. And the dual of this is that the meet of a line and a plane that does not contain that line is going to be a point. You'll see the relationship between these um, statements on either side of the columns in a second. Finally we have that if the meet of two lines is a point then their join is going to be a plane and if it's not if a meet is not a point then their join is going to be the entirety of 3D space. And then the kind of dual statement of that is if a join of two lines is a plane then the meet is a point and otherwise their meet is nothing. In other words the two lines don't meet at all. So how are these different statements on either side of this dividing line related? Well, if you look at it for a while, you should notice that if you replace certain words or phrases, in particular, if you replace the word join with the word meet, point with plain, space with nothing, and the phrase contained in with the phrase containing, then you essentially go from the statements on the left-hand column to the statements on the right-hand column or vice versa. So this is actually not just a kind of word game, it's, it's actually a very deep idea because what it's saying is that if you have a configuration which can be described by these different phrases or a theorem involving these different phrases using these words like join and meet, point, plane, space, nothing, contained and containing, well if you then get that phrase and perform these replacements upon it, then you get another phrase which describes another configuration or theorem or whatever, which is logically absolutely equivalent. So this is a really profound idea because what it means is that you could have a statement about, for example, a load of lines and points in a plane. This is a very natural kind of idea to us to think about two-dimensional space. But performing these replacement operations one can have a logically equivalent statement about properties of lines and planes that, that are sort of in a point or that pass through a particular point. Okay, so we can use this idea of duality in space to find alternative logically equivalent statements to given true statements in geometry. So, for example, here we have a statement that if there are three points that are not all collinear, in other words, they're not contained within the same line, then there's going to be a unique plane that contains them all. And if we apply the replacement rules that we were just talking about, replacing the word point with the word plane, the phrase contained in with the phrase containing, then we get an equivalent statement that 
if there are three planes that are not all containing the same line, then there exists a unique point that's contained in them all. In other words, three planes which don't all hold the same line meet at a unique point. So we can see that we can go from one true statement to another by applying these replacement rules. And we call this process polarizing in space or sometimes finding the jewel of something in 3D space. Okay, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about how explicitly one can find the jewel of a particular figure or configuration in three-dimensional space. So when one's taking the jewel of a, a figure, or another way to say it is when one is polarizing a figure in 3D space, the most fundamental interchange one's making is between points and planes. And this can be done using a sphere. So one can essentially do an operation which is known as polarizing a certain figure with respect to a sphere. So depending upon where the sphere is and how large it is, one will get a different kind of output from such a polarization. Essentially one's using this sphere as a sort of tool to do something that's almost like a kind of inversion. The process is quite similar to the idea of doing an inversion in the, in the sphere for those that have studied such things. Um, but the basic idea is that points and planes get interchanged uh, by using the idea of things which are tangent to the sphere. So this rotating model here represents how a cerulean blue point outside of the sphere would get interchanged with a plane that cuts through the sphere. So um, when one does this polarization, well in general when one does polarization one would refer to a lower dimensional object as a pole and the higher dimensional object it gets interchanged with, in this case the point getting interchanged with a plane, well, the higher dimensional object is called the polar. If you want to remember it, you can think, well, polar is a longer word and it refers to the high dimensional object. So in this case, the polar of a point outside of a sphere is a plane which cuts through the sphere um, through the circle which the cone from the point which meets the sphere tangentially forms. Conversely, one could say that the pole of a plane which cuts through the sphere is going to be the point which is the place where all of the lines tangential to the sphere at the place where the plane cuts through it meet. That would give the point at the apex of the cone. And for a point inside the sphere, if we think of all the set of external points that have polars, which are planes passing through our inner point, well, the set of all such points outside the sphere form a plane outside the sphere. And that's actually going to be the polar of our point inside the sphere. OK, then, so we just discussed how we can dualize points and planes. Now let's how, have a look at how we can use the sphere to convert a line through two points into its dual which will be a line contained in two planes. So the way we can do this, let's say we have a black line such as this one that passes through the sphere 
we're using the sphere to do our polarization. And what we can do is find the two tangential planes to the sphere where this line passes through it. And then these two tangential planes will meet at another line, this orange line shown here. And so that will, in fact, be the dual of this black line. So this is how we can convert one line into the line in its dual figure. And the way we can convert back, let's say we know this orange line that's outside of the sphere, and we wish to find its dual, the line through two points, well, if we line up the diagram so that this line here appears like a point because it's facing right at us, it's pointing right at our eyes, well then, essentially we have something that looks like a two-dimensional picture where we have two lines. If we draw two lines from this effective orange point, which meet this green object, which now looks like a circle, tangentially, then um, we see the two places where the green circle is met tangentially. And if we just join those two tangential meeting points, that'll give us our black line. And then we can rethink this diagram, what this diagram's like in 3D space. Also, just for completeness, let's have a look at this limiting case here, where these two points are near each other. So in this case, our black line, the, the dual of that is going to be the other line tangential, which is um, perpendicular to the black line. Notice that unlike the things we've been looking at earlier, which have been made out of infinitely large lines and planes and such, this cube can really be thought of as made of finite pieces of line or line segments, if you like, and finite pieces of plane, or polygons, if you like. Okay, so there's a couple of ways of thinking about how to polarize a polyhedron, such as our cube here. The simplest way is just to add a point into the middle of each face, as is shown by these red points here, and then link a pair of points by line segments when the corresponding faces have an edge in common in the original polyhedron, i.e. the cube in this case. So that's a kind of um, general method to uh, polarise a polyhedron. However, one can also do it using the rules I was just talking about involving a sphere. In this case, using, say, a light blue sphere. So if we inscribe such a sphere inside our cube, then we can see that taking every line of this cube, we can find a kind of polar line of it, or the polarized line, which will be a, a line which is partially contained in this sphere. In fact, in this special case, we need to consider the line segment which is contained in the sphere. And um, that will give us one of our edges of this green octahedron shape, which is indeed the, the kind of dual or polarized version of our cube. OK, so it's not only the explicit planes and lines of these polyhedra that we can think about the duals of. We can also think about kind of implicitly defined elements and what their duals may be. So in particular, I'd like to ask you to look at this blue plane, which passes through these kind of four points of the octahedron, which form this kind of square across its middle, as, as is shown here. And I want to ask you, what is the dual of this plane? 
So um, you might want to pause the video and have a think about this. Okay, so I'll answer this question. If we look at these four vertices of the octahedron, which are contained in this plane, well, what's the dual concept of that? Well, it would be the planes of the cube, which contain the corresponding vertices. So in particular, we'd want to be thinking about these particular planes of the cube. And just as the plane, the blue plane, is the plane which contains the, vertice, the four vertices of the octahedron, so the dual of that is going to be the point which is contained in these corresponding purple planes of the cube. But hang on, do these planes all contain a common point? Well, they do. It's just that that point is not finite. If you think about what we were saying about infinite elements before, uh, you should be able to convince yourself that these four purple planes have a common point. It's just that that point is at infinity. So let's finish there for this lecture. And as a final question for you, I'd like you to determine the dual of a hexagonal prism such as the one shown here. That is the kind of shape you get by taking a hexagon, a six-sided polygon, and another hexagon directly above it and then extending lines down to create six extra faces. So the way you can, if you can just draw a jewel of this on a piece of paper Perhaps you can do this by pausing the video and then making a trace of the shape. And then the way you can construct the jewel is just like before by placing new vertices in the centre of each face and linking vertices by lines when the corresponding faces have an edge in common.